good that you still be in good hands. Uh, we, we, we follow the uh, YouTube channel and I even saw Brother Shabalala and you were on the other day, eh? Right. <laughs> I was surprised. You see, maybe we're busy unearthing some uh, jewels, eh? Amen. Hey, hey, <laughs> But God bless you, Thank you, my brother, for all your assistance and everyone else working with the ministry. Amen. So, uh, I think we can go to the reading of the word. Thank you, Brother Joshua, the music and everything. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. So, we'll turn to uh, Colossians um, chapter 1. I want to speak this morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very presumptuous. I haven't uh, given the Colossians 1, 25 to 27. I also have it here for us. For those that don't have the Bibles, Colossians 1, 25 to 27. Amen. 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 I'll give everyone a chance just to turn to the portion. I hear still some leaflets in the turning. Amen. Colossians 1, 25 to 27. Wherefore I am made a minister, this is Paul speaking, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And what is this that he's talking about? Even the mystery, so it's a mystery, and as we know, a mystery in these days, there is no more mysteries. But if it was a mystery back then, now as we may open in our day by God's grace, which has been hidden from ages and from generations. So you could say from when time began, physically as in the human form, but now is made manifest to his saints. Amen. Isn't that good to know that now we can know what is this mystery? Amen. Now even Paul, he was obviously preaching under divine inspiration, but that full mystery only came out in this day. Amen. Under the prophet's message. And then he says here in verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of what? What is the riches of his the glory? And what is the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, as we know that is us? Now, what is this mystery? Which is Christ in you. So this is the mystery. It's Christ in you, and this is the hope of glory. Amen. This is the hope of glory. This is what everyone's trusting and everyone wants to see. All heaven wants to see Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen. Let's just uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we say thank you for this time together. May you just be welcome amongst us, Lord. Bless the people. May you just touch our brother for sure. We just keep putting it out there, Lord. We know that you said as a baby keeps crying out to his mother. So we we'll keep crying out to you. We say, Lord, you're going to see my brother in touch him. In Jesus' name, Lord, we will not doubt your potential, your abilities. You are, Lord, limitless in what you can accomplish. May you also just now take hold of the service, take hold of my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, everything, put me out of the way. Anoint me, anoint the people, and may it be straight from your heart to theirs. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated this time. If you don't mind, I'm going to just take a jacket. I feel the heat of the lunch, so uh, we're all very comfortable. Amen. So, um, we see that uh, amongst the Gentiles, which is us, the bride of this age, something has to take place. Something has to take place where Christ is in us completely, and that ultimately is linked to the hope of glory that was there before the foundation of the world. And Abraham says, these things God had in his mind before even the world began. Now there's a very common saying amongst us, and you will hear it in school, you hear it in politics, you hear it in sports, you hear it in whatever type of a career. But they often will say this, if you can just see your value, then you will rise higher. You'll become better in whatever your potential is. If you can just see your value. And so, so is this, maybe in the natural realm, we want to say that this is also 100% applicable in the spirit realm. Amen. If you can see your value, then there can be a change in you. Amen? Amen. Now, it won't necessarily overnight fix. You know, we, we, we often like uh, overnight fixes. That's the human nature. Quick fixes, get us sorted. We don't like to wait. But this is a process that God wants to get in us, that He wants us to realize. And even Brother Bradham makes a very well known statement that the bride realizes who she is in her position. 
then the rapture can take place. Very well known thing. We throw it around so many times, but we're still here. Amen. Amen. So we clearly don't haven't come to that place where we should be, and that God needs us to bring us to that realization. So that is the principle this morning, just to try and sort of maybe lay a, a thought of what has God called you to, and then maybe to investigate a couple of the things that maybe prevent us getting there. Amen. Amen. You see, a pauper. You can imagine a bum on the street that is homeless. He's just uh, got no hope, no money. He's got rags on him. He's a hopeless case. You can think of a go bigger now on the street, a pauper. And yeah, imagine out of nowhere pulls up this black limousine. Yeah. And he says to him, and they, 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 they see this guy, he's all ruffled and he's unshaved and it's hard to even recognize him. So, uh, they, they, they ask him, are you, are you Mr. Toso? And he says, yes, I am. And he would, they would say maybe along the lines of, um, is this your ID number? Yes, it is. Um, I, I don't think you belong here. I don't think you belong in the street. We, we found out that you had an uncle in Europe. You know, he was a relative of the Queen. <laughs> And he has, a, he has mansions, and he has riches, yeah. uh, unbeknownst to you. And according to our doctor, uh, docs, uh, docs, doctors, whatever you want to call them, documents, you are the nearest living relative that she's currently alive. Yeah. Um, sir, please can you step inside the limousine? <laughs> and you can imagine the guy, he just, he's, not, he's dirty, he's, he's still so uncomfortable. You can imagine the guy. Now this guy is dirty, he's ragged. He must climb into this shiny black limousine and he just feels out of place. He feels like this is not me. This is not me. I do not like this at all. But meanwhile, this guy is a seriously wealthy man and he's got titles to him. He's not an average Joe at all. But for him to come from there to here is not going to be a process. First time, when they get back to the hotel, go down to build a shower and a clean and a shave and trim his hair and make him look presentable, that'll be the first step. Amen. And so often we as Christians, first step, we get baptized, we set off our old life, we give it to God, but there's still a process that God is following with us. We've done the first step. We've realized our calling. So Christ has stepped down and pulled us out of our lonely estate. But we still haven't quite got to where we should be. And God has a desire that we would realize our full potential. You can imagine the guy as he's now learning to learn. He teaches, he used to pop and yell, he's just in there, you know, with his fingers and his back. Now it's like, ah, you, you, you've got status, buddy. You know, you need to use the knife and the fork. And by the way, there's not one fork and one knife. There's the knife for the fish, there's the knife for the butter, there's the knife for the egg, and then there's like six knives this side and six forks, and he, you know, he just, he doesn't even know where to start. And then someone has to come, well, let me teach you. And this one is, you use it for that. And this one you use it for, I mean, I'll be honest, give it a try. If anyone has ever gone to a little fancy place, and you sit there, you see all these things, you also kind of just, I mean, I'm not, I just don't know. And you also feel a little bit scared. So you can imagine a guy that has never done this, and so he will have to be taught the ways of his status, his position. And it will take time. He have to learn how to, to, to present himself, to be well spoken, to, to change his, his actions. And you can imagine also getting a first class flight back to the UK. You know, he, he doesn't wish to maybe even flow before in his life, but he starts experiencing all of these things and gifts and, and things that God has given us. You start experiencing on this life's journey with God. But truly, yes, you still haven't got it. Because still you're going to have to inherit all that God has given you. Amen. Amen. And so that, that, that poor man still doesn't quite get it. But eventually he comes to the place when he's in his huge palace mansion or whatever it is that he actually has inherited. And he walks in. And maybe his initial action is to say... Um, do you mind, uh, please, you know, is it okay? And if I was looking and saying, you're the boss. You do it. Do what you want. You have the power. 
You have the ability. It's yours. You hold the position. You were born for this. It's yours. And so we have a situation here where I believe we're living in a time as message believers where we're in the exact same boat. Whether we like it or not, we are royalty, but we act like message paupers. We act like message paupers. We do not realize the value in us. We look at ourselves just the average Joe out there, but we know God has placed us in a royalty level above any king or queen on this earth of the world. You are way above that, yet you do not understand your potential. You do not live up to your potential. The message is just a tradition, it's a way of life. You just do this. This is what I do. I'm a message kid. Brother Joshua, you'll know this. I'm the same. We want the message. We just, this is what we do. I could just be a Muslim. I could be a Hindu, but I'm a message kid. And you go through life, this is what I am, this is what I do, but there's nothing sparky. There's nothing real as to what I'm supposed to be doing. Amen. People, you can see, most people are bored of the message. You can see it because they're just so distracted. They're all over the place. You know, when I thought the rapture was supposed to take place 20, 30 years ago, here we are. What is this? Oh, you know what? It's okay. This is what I do. I'm comfortable. I'm okay in my long dresses. I'm comfortable in this. I'm comfortable. So whatever. I'll just carry on doing this. But there's no life. And God is saying, I've called you for something higher. Amen. And as we know, the saying, where there's no vision, the people perish. And that's why we have a problem with this message. There's no vision. You're not realizing. I'm not realizing. I'm in this with you. Okay? I'm preaching with you. We don't realize who we are. We don't understand what God called us for. And thus, we don't live up to what God has made us to be. Amen. And that needs to change. Because why? Yet again, when the bride realizes who she is, that rapture can take place. I want to get out of here, brothers and sisters. I want to realize who I am. I want to get out of here. And I need to understand what God has called me for. So, the bride's purpose is execute. Now, one sermon you have to, every Christian, every message believer, I, I know it's a long sermon, but you just have to do it. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. It's a must. It's a must because actually, that was one of the pinnacles of the full seven seal revelation that came out. Because on Revelation 10, 7, it said, in the days of the voice of that angel, amen, then the mystery will be revealed, amen. So thus, can we see the mystery of God? What is it? But the very shows is Christ. But he, that is just a sermon title. When you actually go into the sermon, all of the focus becomes the bride. You will see it for yourself. Amen. But let's lay a foundation. As you heard, you saw my sermon title, The Second Fall Purpose of Christ. Amen. Amen. Notice, God has a threefold purpose in this great mystery secret. It's a great mystery secret. Amen. Amen. But the Bible shows that it's all tied into the seven seal. Seven seals have many dimensions. You can't limit it. But this is the, the, the crux of it. This is what he was pointing to. This is what God wants to achieve in us. Amen. Yes, right. And this mystery secret was even before the world began. But God had a plan. He wanted this to come. Amen. Amen. So God, in this great mystery secret that he had before the world began, he had got a threefold purpose in it. God had a threefold purpose. And now what we want to go upon this morning is what is the threefold purpose, see? Now I believe by the help of God who is present, he'll show it to us. Now if he had the his threefold purpose, we want to find out what this threefold purpose is. The first thing, purpose number one, God wanted to reveal himself to the people. God in Christ. That's what is his first purpose. He wanted to be able to reveal himself. God wants to be a savior. He wants to be a healer. He wants to even be a son. He wants to be a father. How can he accomplish this? By coming himself and birthing himself into a son that can make these attributes come out. So that was his first desire. Okay, number one. Now, this is where we come in. And we look at God and Christ and say, wow, amazing, incredible, but we don't put ourselves in the second part. Second, to have the preeminence. Amen. By this in his church. Amen. Let me quickly show.
should say uh, really explain this preeminence. This is now a uh, from the biblical version. Preeminence. It means superiority, especially in noble. Remember, we are noble. We are royalty or excellent qualities. The word stands for mata. What is over and above. So in other words, you have this over and above excellence. Man had uh, no preeminence above the beast that was talking about now um, in Isi Latin, Isi but anyway, that was the Messiah. The point to be first, that in all things he, Christ, must have the preeminence to be first. Amen. Uh, yeah, that's it, I think. It's a bit detailed, but I'll just leave it there. Okay, so that's what he wants. He wants to be first in your life. He wants to have complete control of your life. He wants to be in you, working through you to this world. Amen. Amen. Secondly, to have the preeminence by this in his church, which is his body, the bride, so he could have the preeminence to express himself through them. He wants to express himself through you. All right. And thirdly, which is what's to come, to restore the kingdom to his right position that found by sin by the first and back to where he walked in the call of the evening with his people, talking with their fellowship again. That's what he wants to go back to. Yeah. So, my question is, has the first fold purpose of God been accomplished? Yes. God, Christ came down on earth. Amen. He did all that he had to do. The first fold purpose of Christ is accomplished. The third, we know, is coming. Where are we now? The second fold purpose of Christ. This is where the main picture is currently. Now, the school people know this. Remember the relay team? Remember the relays? You had a baton in your hand and you had to run. And then as the person is approaching, you hold out your hand and you wait and you go and then you run again. They generally run the track or before whatever people. This is the image you need to get in your mind. Christ has handed the baton to the bride. He's handed the baton to you. You need to now run with the baton. You need to do all that Christ had done. Is now being shifted to the bride. The spotlight is on you. The focus is on you. All heaven is looking to you. That is not you are the hope of heaven, the hope of glory, as we as we were reading in our opening scripture. The spotlight is now on us. What are we going to do about it? You see, you have a ministry, you all have a ministry, and it's not necessarily the ministry like me standing behind the pulpit. That's just a small part of it. The ministry is a multi-member body. No longer a Moses one. No longer an Elijah one. Many Moseses. Many Elijahs. All coming together at once. That's what makes this message so special. This has never been accomplished in all of history. There will be a bunch of people sitting here that can come under the preeminence, complete subjection to Christ, and let Him use you as a direct channel to work through. Amen. I want to be part of that, don't you? Amen. I want to be part of the bride ministry. And like I said, it's not about behind the pulpit. It's about how you can interact, how you can support life. Because life sits with the bride now. The bride, the, the life has been sent into the bride through him. She's just a recipient. She's like a woman with a womb. She receives him. Amen. And then she just brings forth the sign of the child of God through her. Amen. Make sure that you are submitted to him. Amen. Look at these beautiful quotes. I'm just laying a quick foundation we'll get into. Yes, sir, the church is no longer the mouthpiece of God. So that's the church domination. They're no longer. It's its own mouthpiece. It's doing its own thing. So God is turning on her. He will confound her what? Now you look at the prophet only. Through the prophet, do you look at William Brown? Yeah, he, he spoke, he, he, he addressed the denominational system, whatever. But it doesn't end there. And the bride. Amen. He will confound her through the prophet and the bride, 
For the voice of God will be in her. Yes, it is. For it says in the last chapter of Revelation, verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride together, one, say, come. Once more, the world will hear direct from God as at Pentecost. But of course, the word bride will be repudiated, which means rejected as in the first age. The world will hear direct from God via the word bride in this day. Amen. 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 It has to be. Amen. Because a woman and her husband become one. They become one. And so does the bride and Christ become one. The ministry of the bride and the ministry of Christ is the same. Amen. You cannot separate yourself from it. Whether I mean, you can believe it or not is not the point. If you've got His life inside of you, you shine forth that same life. Amen. That is inside of you. The mercy seat is within you because that's where Christ dwells. Amen. Do you realize that? You are the mercy seat. Be careful what you do with that mercy seat. Amen. Amen. Let's just tie that up. Okay. Now, we all know so well that quote, all that was in God, yes. all, all, yeah. all, <laughs> all that is in God, He poured into Christ. We all know that well. Amen. So here we have God. God. A perfect God. Logos, Elohim. Self-existing one, creator of heavens and earth. Amen. 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 This is this God, this original God, that now pours himself into Christ. And I think you would all agree with me, when we think of that God of the Old Testament, it's quite distant. It's a bit far. Yeah. It's, you, you obviously enjoy the stories and the wonderful things that happen, but it still feels far. But here, all that's in God, he goes in. And he pours into Christ. Amen. Amen. Now the picture is starting to change. Okay. So we have Christ, a perfect God, now in flesh. Amen. Amen. No sin. No sin. But he was tested and tried in all things. So it's good to know we're serving now a God that knows my trouble, that knows my weakness, that knows the struggles I have. He's faulted. The Bible said in all things. He was tested and tried. So he understands us. And that's why he becomes a perfect mediator and high priest. Because now he understands us. He can sympathize with us. He empathizes. He knows he's been in our shoes. Amen. And now he can go when we say we're sorry. He can say, Lord, I, God, I understand. Obviously, it's all the number two gods in your head. But it's the principle of this holy God. And you have Christ as the intercessor. Amen. But it's just it's just offices as they take with all the one same person. Amen. Don't think with a human mind, you have to think in a spiritual sense. Amen. So here we have this Christ. Amen. Thank, thankfully we have a Christ. But still, here we have a Christ. He's still perfect. Amen. He's still a perfect God. Now the picture changes. All, oh, all, oh, all. Oh. That's in Christ, he now what? Is pouring into the bride, the church, amen. But now we know the church is no longer the denominational church, it's the bride, amen. But the picture changes. The picture has changed. Not really. Spiritually speaking, nothing has changed. But from what we see, it has changed. Because you only have a bride that's got the exact same, but she arrives in a condemned flesh. Amen. Amen. She's sold under sin. From when you arrive on earth, you're already a sinner to begin with. Amen. Amen. You're born in shame and sin and iniquity. Amen. Amen. You come into the world speaking lies. Amen. Amen. And on top of all of that, even if you're a Christian believer and you're the child of God, you come with amnesia. You can't remember. Amen. You don't remember anything. Amen. 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 You're just passing through life. Trying to figure it out loud, what's going on, Lord? Yeah. Then the word comes your way, something inside of you is burning. You, 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 you can't even explain it, but you just like you love the Lord, you love the word, you love to hear it. There's something in me that burns, but I don't get it. That this great God, this great Christ now, all of him is poured into me. And all I see is my humanness. All I see. Okay. 
is the sin, the flesh element that is part of us. And it's a hard thing to deal with. It's a very, very hard thing to deal with. So, let's highlight Christ and the bride for a second. Let's bring them up. Amen. What? Remember, you can't compare us on physical. Christ was sinless. We are not. Hallelujah. I'm talking now natural. And that is spiritual. We can claim that when we confess our sins, He wipes the world. But I'm saying now, you have to take the picture on face value. You have to say what say. Let's just say what Satan had to see. <laughs> Let's just say what Satan had to see if he looked at us. He, you, he, you, you see Christ sinless, and then you come to us, and He sees a, a picture that's messy. It's not so good. But there's one element that ties us to Christ, that Christ had to achieve on earth, that we also have to achieve. And that is adoption. Christ first had to live his life, go through all these things before he found his adoption, and the same goes for us. So we found a link between us, Amen. the adoption. Amen. Between us. So, let's go to this. Adoption. What? Let's just really break it down. Now, adoption, when we talk about adoption and say perfection and stuff like this, we get it wrong. I'm going to say that again. When we talk about perfection, we get it wrong. But the Jonathan, I can tell you now, when you think perfection, you think squeaky clean, do nothing wrong, then you're perfect. Am I right? That's what we, that's what we talk about. Do nothing wrong, you're always doing things right. That's perfection. Yeah. Not biblical. Okay. Not biblical. Yes. Okay. You see, if adoption immediately equals perfection, then when Christ was born, remember he was born without sin? He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. That means he would be adopted as soon as he was born. Yeah. Because the perfection that you guys, well sorry, but I'll say, we consider perfection as no sin. That means as soon as Christ was born, he should have been adopted straight away because he had no sin and he never sinned. So how could it be that he never sinned but he still had to come to his adoption? Yes. So maybe we've seen it a bit wrong. When you start going to the biblical, you start to see what is perfection. Adoption, perfection comes from, if you go to the original, it means completion. So perfection, biblical, is to come, to complete, to come to the place that you're supposed to be. You come to maturity. You come to the end goal that Christ has for you. That is is biblical perfection. Not squeaky clean, doing nothing wrong, never thinking bad, never doing ah, ah, ah. That's not it. It's completion. It's coming to maturity. It's coming to the end goal. That's what is perfection. Because like I said again, if perfection was doing nothing wrong, then Christ should be adopted on his birth. And as you know, it didn't happen. It only happened on Mount Transfiguration when he was about 31 or 32. Did he get his adoption? Another phase of adoption is getting the victory of character. Why? Because we discussed this many times. You're going to rule and reign with him. co is with him. But you need the character to rule. Otherwise, as we know, character is satanic. I mean, uh, power without character is satanic. So we have to get this character. And that's led to the adoption. Maturity to handle the spoken word. We talk so much about the third pool. God cannot give us third pool until we have the maturity to handle it. We must have that maturity to handle the spoken word right now. Where your signature is as good as his in the checkbook. Third pool fruit. Amen. So we can start to see. Look your way. Yes, a similarity between us and us. There's an adoption that has to take place. And it's not the adoption I'm thinking. It's the adoption of coming to the place God has predestinated to be, that He has a desire to come to that second full purpose of God. Amen. But yeah, what it talks about is adoption. 
Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So he had to learn. We all think that Christ just had it all together. He never had to struggle. He never. He always had his faith. And God only showed him elements. He did it on purpose because he needed him to come to that. So this, if you want to know how you're going to learn to get the obedience, then it's going to come to things that you're going to have to go through. That you're going to have to learn to trust and wait out the process. And being made perfect, it comes up again. And being made perfect, when he became, to come to that place of adoption, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Amen. Maybe you fall under that. He was too tempted to learn. For he came him for whom are all things, about whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory. That's all of us. What? To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's how he came to his perfection, his completion. For both he that sanctified, which is Christ, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is he not ashamed to call them brethren? Amen. Because we are now part of him. So you see, Christ had to learn obedience. He had to come under subjection. And why? By learning to always wait on the Father's will. But also to get himself completely out of the way. He said those famous words, I do nothing unless the Father shows me. We need to get to that place. And it can see out of our reach, it's possible. We'll read something just now that's going to show where we go wrong. We go wrong because we allow things to get in between us and Christ. But he is there knocking, wanting to come in. He's wanting you to come into his presence. Amen. That's his desire. Now, in the sermon, Christ and the mystery of God reveal one thing that he really loves to bring out is that spirit of humility. And that he says the bride must be a prisoner to Christ. Amen. In other words, completely surrendered to Christ. That's where we have to get. And I'm with you on this. I am preaching with you. I know I have to get more of me away. Because then God can start using this flesh, amen, to for that second full purpose that He can work through me. And the battle will come in humility and we have to become prisoners. He even talks about that. Love slave to him. Amen. Because you've changed your sensations. You're now the bride. And that's a, a subject for another day. We won't go there. Maybe Lord, we'll the next time I'll come we'll take the next. So, we are clearly struggling. Everyone agree to sometimes understand our potential. We are the bum on the street, the, the hobo that doesn't understand what God has given us. So what is it? Because obviously what happens is we look at ourselves and that is where we find ourselves being caught up and we're not able to completely let go and let the Lord work it for us. Amen. So, one thing we're going to have to understand is there's a couple of things, and I know I've tried to tackle this again, but I'm going to have to remind you so you remember it. You will always have a sticky nature. Okay, so you'll never be able to get away from it. You will have thoughts in the flesh that you'll never be able to get rid of, just like Paul. He never got rid of the thought of the flesh. Amen. But there will always be times when you will want to do good that evil is present. These things you cannot get away from. And these things are going to distract you from getting yourself out the way for God to use you as a channel for God to be able to take over you. You want to have some quotes? Say now. I'll just show you exactly what the prophet says. Amen. Amen. We would know that today is the law of con- contrast. That where there is good, there is evil. Where there is right, there is wrong. Amen. Oh, but look what he says here. You don't want to hear it, but I have to tell it to you. And we will never, no matter what our environment may be, ever be able to shake ourselves from the presence of either. Because Paul said, when I would do good, then evil. Is present. So God is not looking 
at what you can produce within yourself. That's the biggest mistake we want. We want to get our side. Before we find think we, we acceptable and we acceptable to God, we think we first have to clean ourselves, get our lives right, then we can walk into the presence of the King. He doesn't work that way. He says, come into my presence and I will show you who you are. Come into my presence and I can pregnant you with the word of God. And that baby just naturally will grow within you and bring forth the word child within you. You have to get in the presence before you can now start going back out and getting what you need to do. So you have to ignore this. You have to ignore what Satan is going to throw this at you. Yeah, yeah, look at you again. Already? Come on. He's just going to be hitting you all of the time and things you're going to have to do. But you have to keep saying, Devil, I'm not prepared to accept your blame. I've made right that is under the blood. All I know is I want to please God. And yes, I know I need to get things out of my life. I know I need to clean up some things. But by His grace, He will be able to clean this out completely and then get me to a place where He needs me to be. Amen. Just something else to tie in with that first one. How can I take a cockerbur and make a grain of wheat out of it? It's impossible for me to do it. The only way it can be, because inside that cockerbur has been transmitted from cockerbur to a germ called wheat life. So we were cockerburs. We got this human flesh. But what God can do is He can put that wheat life inside you cockerburs. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Then you bury that cockerbur and it'll produce a grain of red wheat. That's right, see? Because there has been a life of wheat bit in the cockerbur and the life of the cockerbur has been taken out. But the nature of the cockerbur is still sicky. See? And it will be until this new life has fully been developed out of the ground and raised up again when it comes forth. Then it's no more cockerbur and wheat. But while it's here on earth, while it's here on earth, and a cockerbur is still sticky, but it's got the nature on the inside of it of wheat. And as long as you're in this life, you're going to be sticky and have a carnal nature that's going to bother you as long as you live. But the inside of you, you're born again. And when you're raised up in the likeness of Christ, our sin has gone from you. Yeah. Question asked in 1964. And you know what the person asked about Romans 7? When I would do good, evil is present. And yes. the brand breaks it down and he comes to this where he shows you yeah. what is going to happen. Yes. So I'm going to tell you now, if you want to focus on you, you're never going to be satisfied. Because what the man shows, until you go to the rapture, or until you die, the copper yeah. and the sticky neck is going to come out of time. Yeah. And yes, as time passes, like he says, as the weak life becomes bigger and stronger, so more of that stuff will fall away. Amen. Amen. You might become 99% weak life, but there will be a 1% bit of copper bird still there yeah. that can come out. Yeah. We will make mistakes until the day we leave. Amen. But you have to understand, you have to shake off, you have to shake this flesh veil yeah. and see the deep down side of you that's the real you. Yeah. And if you focus on that element, then you can start to see how God can start to work through you. When you can, and this is no excuse for sin, don't get me wrong, no, no, no. You have to make right everything you never do wrong. Every wrong desire, even, even wrong thought, never mind your actions, everything must be subjected to God at all times. That's the nature of the bride. She's always willing to humble herself, to say sorry, to be able to uh, 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 come in respect and honor to God and say, Lord, I fell. So that's when people get wrong. They think you can just start doing what you want. Never. The bride's heart wants to please God. But the flesh element, the cockleberry element is going to be there. And you have to learn to shut that out of your life and not bother you. I know it affects you because it affects me. Amen. You know when you've done the baby, you looked at a movie you shouldn't have, or you did something that was wrong, you lied, or whatever. Man, and you just feel like you just trying to talk to God. You're so ashamed, you're so disappointed, you're so whatever it can be. Yeah. As long as days can pass, weeks can pass, and you haven't sorted it out of God before God because you feel unworthy. And He says, Get it back in my presence. 
I understand. I've been there. I know what it is like to suffer. But if you can come back and just make right, that dove spirit can come back and keep leading you. Amen. The dove leading the lamb. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians. And this I should be exalted. You see, this is what God has to say to me. That's the thought in the flesh. Paul's talking here about the thought of it. But look at his language. And this I should be exalted about this. In other words, if I can become proud. You know, if, if, if God knows this human nature. We're going to get proud if we've got everything together. Because we just like that. As soon as we like it, got it all together, we start sticking out our chest and strutting around. That's how we are. We just human. You know, he knows our nature. So he just says, ah, oh, buddy. There's a thought. Just keep you on your knees, buddy. Because I can see there's some kind of work out. See, and Paul has to deal with this. And I, I don't know, I haven't read it myself, so if I'm wrong, please forgive me. But somewhere, someone said once, I don't know if the prophet said it or whatever, or if it's just a, in history, but they said that Paul saw in the flesh was his eyes. Right? He, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't um, see properly. Yes. Because of what he was struck down by the light. Amen. So, now, here, here is Paul. What is he? He writes, he's, a, he's obviously the major prophet of Ephesians 8. But what does he do? He's writing letters to the churches. Yes. But uh, tell me, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, Paul is writing godly letters to the people. Yeah. Yet he hardly can't see yes. what he's writing. Yes. Does it seem fair on the human side? No. I'm doing this for you, God. I'm doing it for you. Why are you making me suffer? Just take away the thought in the face. And he asks again. And he asks again. And God says, nope. But it's for your church. It's for your feet. I'm writing to the Ephesians and the Romans and the Hebrews. Come on, give, give me some. Do it for your honor and your glory. Can it seem fair? No, it doesn't seem fair. But yet God gives it to why? And he has to admit it. Paul has not write about it. He obviously realized why. And he says, should I be exalted above measure to the abundance of revelations? Remember, Paul was the best. He was just getting revelations. He was just a so submitted uh, vessel. And God had to put something in there to keep him humble. Besides all these incredible revelations. Amen. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. You know, we can just say, oh, Paul, it's just a that that you still half see, I'm sure, and get around. But you know what buffet means? This is it. You can see it there. Strike with a fist. Maltreat. Treat with violence. <laughs> Something not so fun, eh? I think some of us have some thorn in the flesh that we can say. <laughs> yes. It feels like the devil does that. Yes. He strikes you with the fist the whole time. And Brother Bradley says he has one good shot, at least one. Some of us it's more than one. Yeah. <laughs> he has one good shot. He says you need to cover that. He doesn't tell him to take it away. He says you need to cover that. Yes. You need to keep it covered. Why? How? By, by spending time with God, laying in His presence, praying, all those things. That's how you can cover it. The devil will keep hitting the same place. Yes. Treat with violence. Unless I should be exalted about me. This is it again. Unless I get prideful. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for me, for my strength power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, we can understand that fire. Ah, Lord, come on. I thought that I would be strong all part of my bodies. No, he says, no, that's what I'm going to keep you weak from. I'm going to keep you weak. We have to, just as women and men, we have to watch ourselves. Yes. God, is, you're still a man, brother. You're still a red blood flowing through your veins. That's right. You have to watch those eyes of yours. You don't have a choice. Sister, your emotions and the sweet words that can come, yes. that can fill you, feel in a certain way. You have to watch those things. You still, you still got that nature in you. You're going to have to watch. You're going to have to be careful of. It's not just a magic wand that God says, okay, it's all going to be gone. You're just going to float through now. You're just straight into the rapture. Oh, oh, wonderful. No, 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 no. 
you're going to be fighting. Yes. You're going to have to watch your inward nature. Yes. This is men and women, never mind our individual things, terrible histories, yes. things people have done to us, etc., etc. It goes on and on of the different things. Yes. Oh, look at Paul's attitude. It's just unbelievable. Most men, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. <laughs> so you don't want to glory in them. That's a lack of strength. Weakness, sickness can be both spirit and body, uh, spirit realm and flesh realm. Amen. When you go to the original of the Bible, what it's referring to. So it's referring to multiple dimensions. Some of us have bodily problems. Hallelujah. Like Paul. Some of us have spiritual forms of the flesh. Hallelujah. This can go both ways. Amen. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a paradox. Like Paul, come on, buddy. Hey, that's a tough one to swallow. But if you can understand what he went through, you'll be able to see why he said that. Because that actually is what helps him. Because what would happen if he had a developed a prideful spirit? Paul wouldn't have been Paul. We wouldn't have got out of Paul when we got out. Yeah. But he stayed low, he stayed humble because of that thought. Amen. And no doubt, the devil came and said, uh, Paul, uh, you're preaching, you're writing to the letters, how God is a divine healer, he is not healing your eyes. So I think you got a bit wrong, Paul. I think uh, that's not true. And Paul had to ignore what the devil was saying. Amen. And still persevere. Besides, that, that's quite a thing. We'll also just pick up something that Brother Ram says. So you know what I see a perfect type of here? I see a, you know what I see us as a church right now? A perfect type of Esther. Amen. Esther in the Bible. It's such a perfect type of where I see us as the bride of Christ. So we obviously in a foreign land. As you know, this is not our real church. We come from God. Amen. But we're in a foreign land. And uh, we just did nothing in a nobody, as Esther was once upon a time, before she became queen. Amen. <laughs> Suddenly she gets shocked to creature. Suddenly the beggar becomes royalty out of nowhere. <laughs> and she doesn't know her value. She clearly doesn't know her value. She's married, she's the queen, but she doesn't understand her value. <laughs> because when the whole trouble comes up with the Jews and Mordecai tells her you better do something. She is so scared to go in the presence of the king because she thinks she's going to die. That's she just thinks. And many of us as bride members, when we look at our own, week, our own selves, our own trouble, we feel unworthy that we can't come into the presence of the king because we're scared what's going to happen. Maybe he's just going to disown me. Maybe he'll throw me away. And as you know, they fasted, they prayed, everything. And yet the Queen Easter walks in humility and reverence into the presence of the King. And waiting to hear those words, how dare you, God's grab her and go and stir her outside. That's what she's thinking in her mind. And she's coming humbly before the King, praying that she'll make it. And out of nowhere there's a she hears a tinkle of a scepter being lifted and she lifts up her eyes and there she sees the scepter being shown to her. <laughs> okay, I made it. I'm not dead. <laughs> so she's happy, she's not dead. Amen. Is that where the story ends for Esther? Absolutely not. Yes. Because when the king calls her, he says, Esther, my beloved, so happy to have you in my presence. What took you so long? You didn't need to fast three days. You could just come. I love you. You can have up to half of my kingdom. What? Me? Yes, you, Esther. But I'm a nobody. I'm just an innocent, silly Jewish girl that has no parents. Well, in my eyes, Esther, you can have half of the kingdom. And yeah. It's the first step we need to get into his pride. Get into his presence. You don't have to be fasting and praying for two weeks when you've done something wrong to now think you're going to be worthy and might not die in the presence of the king. He said, get into my presence. In my presence you can see your value. 
that I pledge to you for your value until you come into my presence. And that's a big cry. And he said, you are the second full purpose in this day. You must take the word. Get into my presence. Get into my presence so I can show you your worth. And yes, he just had me to the law the next minute. Esther, after half my kingdom, what is your desire? Anything, anything. Speak it, it'll happen. Amen. So for the bride in this day, but we're too scared to get into the presence of the king. We are too scared. Amen. Amen. So, you know, how the fault invites, um, what's his name, Haman? I think that's right, Haman. The evil guy with the king to her house. And I, I always find it interesting. She has it over for the big banquet. And then the king, after a while, is like, hey Esther, what is it? What do you want? And she's like, can we can you come tomorrow again? I'll prepare another banquet. I kind of wonder like what was the significance of it? Most of it's Esther still too scared to bring forth. Out of what she has, still not realizing who she is. And as you know, there's the repeat banquet. And then the king proceeds her. Is you my bride? You are the one I've given myself to, I've given my very life. What do you want? Speak! What do you want? And he has Esther. Oh king, my people are gonna die. As you know, how it goes and it plays out. And more, how much falls on her and the king comes back in and says, How dare you? You know what's so beautiful? God has given you the power to overcome your own problems in your life. The king gives Esther the power with Mordecai. Whatever you say, it will happen. Sounds familiar in this day? Whatever you say will happen. Amen. If we back up by my authority, just say it. Do it. Yes. And God is wanting you to step into that position and write your degree. Devil, you get off these grounds. You're going to die today. Devil, you are done in my life. And you can write it because the power lays within you to overcome because why Christ is in you. It can overcome your own problems, your own weaknesses, your own things that the devil keeps pointing at you. You have that power within you. He wants to be made manifest through you. He doesn't want Christ to be taking on the devil in the wilderness. He wants you to be taking on just using him and his word in the same way in humility as with Esther. Always falling under the authority, but even in that authority, falling under that authority of the king, he is saying, I took half my kingdom. Just take it. Amen. We just need to trust in that and to believe in that. Amen. These things are real, brothers and sisters. I'll show you the prophet's example here. Yes. Prophet at the top of this, uh, you can say, thorn in the flesh, but God gave him his deliverance at the end. So as many of you know, he was a young boy, he just developed a stomach problem. And every off, so often it would come out and it would be hot, greasy, like water. Anyway, let's just read it. My stomach gets sour. Amen. And all mine, but the jacks is from the wings of the snow white dove. Look at the date. Yeah. 11 28. Yes. Less than a month later, he was dead. That's true. Mm. I walked right around the house and got a hot, greasy water like flying out of my mouth. And I walked to the pulpit and prayed for people that was twice that bad. And they would be healed. Yes. So he's, he's feeling terrible. And he says, I laid them, and, and, and I had them lay my hands on a man with cancer on his face. And the cancer left his face standing there. And I was so sick, I couldn't stand up. Imagine the problem. So much suffering. And he's just, he's just trying, and he's praying, God, please, I, I, I want to pray for your people. I want to have you well in my body so I can give my best. And nothing happens. 40 years he's praying for this, and nothing's happened. And then he's praying for people twice as bad, and they're just going off hill. Nothing's happening to him. 
He lays his hand on the man with cancer, his face with cancer falls in. Nothing's happening to him. Is this fair? No, it's not fair. He has a man and dedicated his whole life for the gospel cause, the seventh angel in our day, the prophet of our day, a man of such faith. Hundreds of thousands, millions of healed under his ministry through Christ. A, a healing ministry never seen before, way greater than Christ himself on his earth. And here's a man that can't even get something small, brothers and sisters, but it's hurting him, it's bothering him, he can't get his healing. Look at what he says here. And you don't know what I've suffered. Oh, you think the prophet had it easy? No. Just mental oppression. Why? Because the devil was on his case. He was healing. Aren't you supposed Is it God the healer? Yes, he's the healer. Why is he not healing your stomach? I trust he's going to do it one day. I pray that I know he's going to do it. Yeah, I don't know about that. 40 years, buddy. 40 years has passed and you're still struggling. Every seven years it comes up all my life. That's where I am now. Seven eights. What is that? 40. So that's, that's 40, that's 56. No, there's something, I think you got it wrong there. I think you meant to say 76. Yeah, I think that was the 77 was, I think, where it came out. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Look what he says here. I was so distressed. I cried. I begged. I pleaded. Does it sound familiar? In your own life, many of you have things that you so distressed you. You cried, you begged, you pleaded, and it's quiet. Yes, nothing. That prophet that's getting no healing has to stand behind the pulpit and preach a sermon of divine healing with full conviction and belief. Besides how he's hurting inside, he's hurting, his stomach is hurting, but he must preach divine healing. Even though he's asked God to heal him so many times, nothing's happening. He must preach it in the same conviction and faith as if it's done. That's not easy, brothers and sisters. That's not easy. Look what he says, I was so distressed, I cried, I begged, I pleaded. You can go and listen, if you use that habit, it's a wonderful sermon. And he just explains how eventually he got the healing, there was a white dove that came seven times ago, there was, a, there was lots that happened there. I, I'm not going to go into the story, but eventually that, uh, that like weasel looking thing jumped, and instead of hitting his mouth, it landed up on his chest. And then he found it impelled on a cactus out of the wilderness. Yes. And he says, I believe I'm now healed. Yeah. Then he comes to the end of the sermon. Now you can ask the question, why God? Why did you let Brother Bram suffer all this stuff? What was the purpose? But yeah. Are you? Yeah, he's singing the song. He made up this purpose of the wings of the song. He says, though I have suffered in many a way, I cry for him both night and day. But faith wasn't forgotten by the Father above. He gave me his sign on the wings of the dove. Now, you must see this. It's beautiful. You want to see what God can do with your weaknesses and how you can turn it on the devil? Watch what happens here. This is now the end. He's praying. Dear God, I thank you for these things, Father. You gave no other sign. You gave the world the sign. You gave me a sign. And the next day, seeing an eagle flying, oh God, there's a message coming forth now. I pray, God, that you'll let the dove leave. God's the Lord. Look what he says here. It's led me to a faith I never had before. All the struggles, the prophets go all those years. When the healing comes, it's led him to a faith like he's never had before. And the actual stomach wasn't a big sickness. He could live with it. It wasn't pleasant, but he could live with it. But to have it delivered, he says, is now born into a faith I've never had before. And that's what God will do with your weaknesses, with your problems. He'll, at the right time, the right season, he will deliver you. He will sort it out. And it will give you a faith like you never had before. And this gets thrown straight in the devil's face. You see how God can work, how he can turn the situation all around on the devil. Amen. I'm almost done with this. Just hang on with Five, ten minutes, I'll be wrapped up. Look at this. Give me some hope. This is what the prophet says here in Power of Transformation. Also, almost right before he's gone. Less than two months he's gone. Look at the language. 
He understood, brothers and sisters, what it was like to be human. Look what he says here. Now, we're not a perfect people. We are not a perfect people. We make our mistakes. We do things that's wrong. But you see, love covers all of that. Look, this is what is the, the real genuine spirit. We're willing, when we see our mistakes, to come back and apologize to one another and to God. Yeah, that's glorious. <laughs> yeah, it's glorious. Not the tough guy that always has to be in control and always has everything together. No, 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 no. It's the one that can humble themselves and do wrong and come and make things right. That's glorious. That is really men and women that gathers. Amen. I want to be counted with those gathered ones. Amen. Any man can step out to the, to the battlefield that's got nerve enough to walk out there, but when he gets knocked down, then get up and try again. See, there used to be a song that a young man wanted to sit in the church and I fall if I fell. See, I forget how it goes when he rise and try again. Forgive me, Lord, and try me one more time. When he corrects it, see, see, if I fall, if I sin, let me rise and try again. Just forgive me, Lord, and try me one more time. So he carries on here. And with as many as 120 people here, with the 30 odd that's here, you are bound to find sometimes the enemy will sweep in among you. He's going to come, brothers and sisters. Don't think it's not going to happen. He's going to come and try to sweep in among you. And through your mind, it might not be a physical attack. It can be in the mind he'll come and attack you. And so this that just so when he does it. And think back. Think of this morning. Think of now. Think of the times when you were sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Some of you are plumbers. Some of you are carpenters. And some this, that, and the other. You rub arms with the world each day and you're out there. But when you see these things and great temptations rise, just remember these little sacred places where you're sitting together with the only thing that lasts. Amen. This is the real. This is where we can come in the presence of the King and find our worth in the King. Amen. Then you can go out there and come to that table. Amen. That bothers you. Your jobs will fail one of these days. Your health will fail. Even your life here on earth will fail. But then that won't fail. Amen. And if He is the center of all these things, then let's keep your minds on the center post. What, what has drawn us to this? Amen. May we keep our minds on the center post. Amen. I'm winding down on this one. Look at this. This is beautiful. Uh, this is talking about Christ, the mystery of God revealed. Like I said, we are talking about the bride is the mystery of Christ revealed. Okay, but look at this here. This is amazing. But all this mystery is revealed only as he promised to his bride. Only you can come in the presence of God and receive his help, his co-ownership of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. To his bride. Oh, look what he says here. Hell is against this truth of the revelation of this mystery. Hell is against you realizing who you are. Hell is against you taking your rightful position as a bride. Because if you take that rightful position, then he becomes useless because he knows you have the power within you. Like Haman to throw and hang him on his own gallows that he created for you. He himself can hang there because of the power you possess and what God has given you. Amen. But the bride is standing on it. Amen. Let us stand on it. Hallelujah. That's her stand. Why do you hunger, church? Why is there something inside of you burning? Why do you thirst? It's the Father trying to reveal this hidden secret to you. But you let so many things get it out of you. You let your job, you let your wife, you let your husband, you let your children, you let the cares of the world, you let some pastor, you let something else get it out of you. When you know that way down in your heart, you're thirsty, you're hungry, it's God trying to reveal it to you. See, the revelation, the last day is here. Amen. The last day when the bride becomes, amen, the fullness of God. Amen. At this time. Amen. So we're going to get these things out of our way. Amen. 
If we see things that are distracting us, if we see things that are pulling us down, we need to ask God to help us deal with these things. Amen. Because the things are getting in between you and getting in the presence of the King. Amen. God has a way, He's going to get you there either way. He'll bring a harm on the deceit. It's going to want to kill people around you. You're going to have a desperation to have to run into the presence of the King. But why don't you just want to go and willingly say, Christ, here I am. Let me hear your sweet secrets. Let me hear your love, love talk to me. Tell me who I am. Amen. Amen. We'll end with this scripture. So simple, but so powerful. Amen. Second Corinthians 3.18. Amen. But we all with an open face. So we are now unveiled. Amen. Behold it as in a glass. Now we say glass in the biblical is actually a mirror. You go to the original. It's the mirror. So we have an open face and we're looking into a mirror. Just image, image, make it in your imagination now. You're now looking into the mirror. What do you see in the mirror? The glory of the Lord. So you are here in your flesh and you're looking into the window. Guess the mirror, sir. Guess what is shining back out of that reflection? The glory of God, of the Lord that is actually coming back. Because that is who you are. He is the one in you. And if you can behold that, if you can keep looking at that and realize this is me, amen, or change, you just need to be transformed. It'll take a process. Change, transform. It means it's going to be slowly transforming. And then what? Into the same image. So I'm seeing Christ's glory shining back to me. But I know I'm about this flesh, but over time, as we can allow ourselves, we'll be transformed, amen, into the same image. When we see it in the mirror, it becomes us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit, amen, of the Lord. That's why we have to make sure we have His Spirit with us, amen. You know the story about the young boy? Never seen her for himself. Just in the, the river, a little bit down there, he couldn't quite see himself. And then he goes to visit his aunt. Hey, now you know the story? And he's walking up the stairs. And he somehow sees a little bit of him. And it, it sort of catches him. Oh, look, another boy. He doesn't recognize that first it's him. Then he walks up higher. He sees more. He sees more. Maybe he's thinking it's maybe just a play buddy. But that's him. That's really who he is. And then he moves his hand. And then that person in the mirror also moves. Thank you. 
rules. And Satan tries to sweep it. Amen. He's not going to be happy. You have to understand. But don't fear. Don't fear. Amen. What you have inside of you is far more powerful than what you can ever get. Thank you. So you just make sure you go out of the Lord. And you remember these times when you felt the pull. Amen. When you felt the turn. And you said, Lord, that was you. Amen. Get into his presence. The better talks about praying in the Spirit. That doesn't just come. You have to keep pushing. So it can come quick. But he says, when you can start praying in the Spirit, then you can start hearing directly from God. Amen. Amen. That YouTube video can wait. Amen. That other thing can wait. Yes. Lay it before Him and keep praying. Maybe just read the scripture and go back in prayer until you can break into that Spirit and you can end up to speak His love. You, amen. He's a good God. He loves you and cares for you. Don't let the devil preach anything else to you. Amen. You need to remember you are the second form purpose of God. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 Lord, for the for the life 
be with them, Lord, we are there and bless them for everything, Lord. I pray, Lord, and for all the family that are here, for the children that are here, Lord, bless them, Lord. I pray, Lord, even for the father of, of the of the flocks, the Lord, bless him where he is, Lord. Be with him, Lord. Be with him, Lord, and give him power. And give him faith, Lord. Give him everything that is desired, Lord. It's our desire, Lord, as a church, to be with him each and every time, Lord. We pray, Lord, and ask everything you are in your hands. I have committed everything as we are going to do to our respect to the Lord. Be with us. And your pastor to read the Bible and the spoken word and to listen to the temperature of the time. As you say in the spoken word, the rapture is in the books and in the church. So I'm going to say that you have to for those things. I pray, Lord, in Christ's name, we will grant you just, just so long when he's waiting for you to be with them with each other. Shall we give him the next travel, Lord? I pray, Lord, that the rapture of is leading us and this, the one who is giving us faith with the Lord. Give him strength on everything that is being transferred. I pray to the Lord. Amen. Amen.